Roto Grinders NFL Food for Thought Podcast. Another week in the books. Happy holidays, everybody. Whatever you're celebrating, I hope you, your family, and your loved ones are having a good week and are safe and are in good health. I'm the Luch, and I'm here with the Chief, and we got a special guest on this week's episode who hasn't been with us since August. But first of all, Will Priester, how you doing, man? Uh, been better. I'm just going to keep it at that. All right. Quick and to the point. We'll take it. We'll take it. Who is our special guest? We'll give you a hint. If you if you tune into Grinders Live in Crunch Time, someone refers to him as the one who will not be named or something like that. But it's our guy, TJ Zwarich. TJ, thanks for coming on. What's going on? Doing well. Always happy to be linking up with you guys. We got some sweats going in this fourth quarter of the Green Bay and LA Rams game. And yeah, our guy Rob is not happy with me right now. I accidentally forgot to say his name when I was laying out who the all the upcoming hosts were for the upcoming shows. And I said literally everyone but him as I was uh, hosting a Grinders Live on the fly. Light scratch for Dean. And so... Rob wasn't happy with me, and it is it has ignited a rivalry between the two of us. But uh, it, it's it's all love. Gotta love some competitive, uh, friendly fire. It's all good. Hey, guess what? This week in the NFL, we saw the dumbest play to ever occur on a National Football League field. The dumbest play. I can't think of anything stupider than what we saw to in the New England Patriots Las Vegas Raiders game. I don't know where you guys want to start. I'll leave it up to you, Chief. Do you want to start with the dumbest play to ever be played? The dumbest play on earth? Oh gosh. Uh let's man, let's just let's just go there. Um uh, let, yeah, let's go there. That, that, that's a good place to start. That'll get me pumped up early. Cause that play cost me a lot. And I won't even get into how much. Well, well it cost me 25x. I doubled up. So let's let's I don't want to be ungrateful here. It is Christmas time and the season of giving, and I, I was given a two x profit. Out anyway, why in the world were they running that play anyway? Like, like let's just call it like this is Bill Belichick we're talking about here. What in the world is that? Like we're running laterals on think- the last play of the game, like. That wasn't anything coaching. That was Ramondre Stevenson thinking he had Jacoby Myers and the Jacoby Myers just going complete brain dead was like, oh, we're doing this now? And just firing it up in the – I truly think like in the middle of the play he forgot they weren't losing. Like the game is tied. And so they basically squandered away an opportunity to have a chance to win. I, I I just I was flabbergasted. I mean, he literally just threw it up in there, and I'm thinking, what what in the world is happening right now? Like this, this can't be happening right now, is what I was thinking. As the defender runs into the end zone after catching a lateral interception in a tie football game, a listen to this, folks, a lateral interception football game to go into overtime. I mean, literally, literally handed the game to the other team. And of all people, was he throwing it to the quarterback? Was he throwing it to Matt Jones? I don't know. I thought he was throwing it to Matt. I, I think he was throwing it to Matt Jones. What is Matt Jones going to do? Maybe he wasn't. I was probably so frustrated. It looked like he was throwing it to Mac Jones. If any of you can reference this play on your television screens, please tweet at me. I'm not even going to look at it. Let's make the show interesting. Tweet at your boy, Chief. Let me know. Who was he throwing that ball to? Because he shouldn't have been throwing it to anyone. All right. I'm done. It was definitely Mac, and it was definitely a bad, bad decision. Oh, God. It's, as you were, as, it's, it's hilarious as, like, as you were going through this rant, I'm watching the Rams and Packers on my other screen, and literally in the last two plays, it was an interception followed by multiple laterals. And now and on this fumbled. last play, it was yes. an Aaron Jones first down run, fumble, four different flags fly up in the air. I have no idea what's going on, but we got some chaos. NFL has been chaotic lately. It just seems like one of the keys to cashing in DFS has been like surviving injuries at this point. 
No one has ever thought more Chandler Jones posters would be printed across the country and hung up in little Raiders fans' rooms, but now we have a signature moment in time with the Chandler Jones catch and stiff arm to Mac Jones into the grassy green turf at the beautiful new Raiders venue in Las Vegas will be an iconic moment on highlight reels and B-roll film, intros and outros, montages for the next 50 years. So Mac Jones was not the culprit. He was the victim of a Jacoby Myers crime in this instance. And before that play, Jacoby Myers, it never struck me that he had poor football IQ. Like there I, was there so much just coach speak before that play that we're going to go out and win this game now that he had it ingrained in his brain that we're going to go out and win this game now on this very play. And he just threw the ball my, up for grabs. My hunch is that as soon as Ramondre Stevenson laddered the lateral lateral the ball to him, it was just done at that point. Like it just like a different gear went off and it was just like a, Oh, it's chaos time. Let's go. You gave it to me. Who do I give it to next? Like just backyard football completely forgot the game situation that they were in. Who turns their brain off and plays hot potato in a professional football game? Like that's what I want to know. Who plays hot potato in a professional football game? That is what this looked like to me. There's always what ifs, but what if the domino effect didn't occur? What if Baker Mayfield never landed on the Rams? What if he never had made a ridiculous sequence to come back and beat that very Raiders team, which pretty much, you know, stuck a fork in them? Could you imagine the hype train with pretty much the Raiders would have been fighting for their playoff lives and to win on that play? It didn't happen. But what a it moment. It already regardless. was crazy enough among Raider fans. Like, as you guys know, I, I run a website called theagentsoffandom.com. We talk about all TV and film, but we started out just talking mostly like straight nerd stuff, comic book, gaming, anime, superheroes. And the Venn diagram between those fans and sports fans is it's more of a circle than you may think. And I'm in a group chat with like 50 people on Twitter from like just like from that community. And there's about eight of them who are Raider fans in it. And they were just going wild when that when those plays were happening. The sequence from that touchdown with like 30 seconds left to to that, like the group chat was just going crazy. I could imagine. I didn't think anything was going to top the Minnesota game. We always talk about the Vikings, Chief. It there seems. we go. Listen, we're in sync now because I was absolutely thinking about it's time to get with the Minnesota game here. That is the story of this weekend. Folks, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, Luch, TJ. So I'm at my son's we basket. Don't, we don't game. we don't fit in those categories. Let's, well, that's that's a reference from from WWE Generation X. Uh, I got you, I got you. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So I'm at my son's basketball game on Saturday, and. I put the score, and at halftime, I saw 33-0 Colts versus the the NFC North champion, Vikings. And I said to myself, oh, wow, this is embarrassing, right? And, and, it, and it was more so embarrassing because this Vikings team just lost – to the Detroit Lions the week before. And so, you know, everybody already thinks that the Minnesota Vikings are frauds anyway. And so the fraud hype train, TJ, was going to be, I mean, powering down the tracks. And so, Luch, and Luch, I think you'll appreciate this. I'm sitting in the stands at my son's basketball game. I'm thinking to myself, oh, boy, when we get on food for thought, on Monday, this is going to be a story for the ages. Luch, by the time I left the game, the Vikings won 39 to 36. And I said to myself, oh boy, this is crazy. Totally different narrative now about the NFC North clinching Minnesota Vikings. 
I didn't watch the game, so I don't know all the little intricacies that happened. But I do know, based on the clips, the highlights, there were touchdown passes, there were touchdown runs, and there were – yeah, I know. Thank you. I not yet thank you. We'll talk about it. There were massive, massive amounts of sweats happening during that game. Vikings come back in one of the biggest comebacks in NFL history. And trust me, my son's basketball game was more fun than watching that game. I can tell you that right now. But my God, I did not expect to see 39-36 when I roll out to the car checking the stats. Unbelievable. I, I don't know if I feel any better about the Vikings. I, I mean. No. Oh, Luke, don't do this. It's not about feeling better. Like, okay, you got to respect. I'm still hurt. I am hurt. I'm hurt. Okay, I'm hurt. let me ask you this. When Tom Brady comes back down, down 28-0 in the Super Bowl, what do we call Tom? What what are we saying about that team that was dead in the water at halftime? He took advantage of our good friend Matt Ryan, just as the Vikings did. That poor guy, Matt Ryan, who can't even throw for 200 yards when his team hangs 36 on Minnesota. Seriously? Oh, I maybe Frank it, Reich was right about bringing in Sam Ellinger early. Maybe he was. I, I don't know what to say. Hey, as a Titans fan, I had a brutal week as well. But to see a Colts blow that game made my heart a little bit happier. I, listen, what do you want to say? That the Vikings can't put four quarters together? Is your glass half empty? Or do you want to say your glass is half full and they rallied after they were completely dead to win a National Football League game? What, what would you guys prefer? What is your Vikings narrative? How do you portray my, this team? My, my Vikings narrative is that it messed up my money because I had 30% Colts defense in the 100 teams that I hand built on Friday night. And I uh, I really th- and I had 50% Josh Allen. Like, I thought I was going to be winning all the money after that first half. Didn't have any question. full Viking stacks with the Lions defense, like a bunch of people, which was frustrating. <laughs> K.J. Osborne went off. Justin Jefferson went off. Dalvin Cook found a way to go off in a, the biggest negative game script of all time. In overtime, he catches the little zero-yard screen pass out wide and rips it to the crib. Pretty much. Or was that fourth quarter? Whatever it was. Fourth quarter. I mean, like, everyone was finding a way to get there on Minnesota. Fan, for, like, DFS and fantasy purposes. Just ridiculous. Uh, that game had so many twists and turns, I forgot exactly when that was. But 460 from Captain Kirk. What's up with uh, Jonathan Taylor? Do we need an injury update here? Because I think that is a oh, huge thing. As season. He's done for the season. They've already said it. You know, we're in the thick of all kinds of postseason annual leagues and best balls and how about that best ball playoff advancement fantasy football leagues and all of a sudden we got jonathan taylor and and uh jalen hurts out for the regular season jalen hurts how long is he done for the next two weeks they said (sighs) brutal brutal i mean I, i could see a lot of jonathan taylor teams not getting there right i mean you're probably not in a decent spot if you're a Jonathan Taylor owner at this point, but you know, a majority of teams that were at least in the playoff hunt or the best ball hunt, Jalen Hurts was, was squarely in that percentage of players that are affecting a lot of things happening. And I tell you what, he played pretty well in the second half, even if he was playing hurt. I mean, the Eagles found a way to get it done. Should we go there? Should we go to Philly? Do we want to talk about Philly and the Bears? I mean, you know. No one's knocking the Eagles for squeaking by the Bears, right? But we knocked the Minnesota Vikings, Chief. When they, you know, when they barely win, but no one's saying squat about Philly just getting by the Bears. Exactly. That that's what I and this this is what I'm talking about, Luch. Thank you. Like, why are we so down? And look, I'm not a Minnesota fan and I'm not a Minnesota truther. What I am saying is let's not call an eleven and four football team, eleven and three, whatever they are. A fraud, like they're winning football games. I mean, it might not be as pretty as the next person, but don't look now. Dallas just lost a football game. The Lions just beat the Jets. The Chiefs all lost to the Texans. Like, it's happening to everybody. 
Look, but I'm not we, saying we, that the Vikings. We say about the Vikings every week, like they're the frauds. This I'm not saying the do. Vikings are frauds, but I'm saying no one in the NFC is very good. Mm. Ah, you're entitled to yeah. your opinion. Eagles are the best team. Don't get me wrong, and they are a very good football team. Very complete offense and defense. Good O. Good pass rush. Outside of them, like. Look at this play. Look at this NFC playoff picture right now. We have the Vikings, who, yes, have a good record, but are terrible defensively. And at the end of the day, how much do we trust Kirk Cousins in the playoffs? We got the 49ers with 18,000 different injuries on their team. We got the Bucks in fourth, who have looked pathetic. The Cowboys, who have uh, looked great at times and fraudulent at times. Then it's the Giants and the Commanders. Like the NFC is not good. When you compare it to the AFC where you got the Bills, the Chiefs, Bengals, and even it is not that deep. You can throw, I think, the, the Ravens up there as well when they're healthy, but they've looked so poor lately, it's kind of hard to think of them in that lens. Like, I feel like it's just a lot more of an even NFL this year, especially in the NFC, where none of these teams are that head over heels better than any of the other ones. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a fair assessment. In my opinion, um, I might have came out too hot with saying like they stink, like it's not that, but like there's no, it's not the ju- like there's it's not the juggernaut three or four teams up top that we usually see. They've been on the right side of I think every one score game they've been in so far this year. I can't remember what I said on last week's podcast, but they've been on the right side of a lot of a lot of variance and a lot of close calls. It, it's exciting though. They got exciting skill players. They're they're fun to watch. Um, listen, I I, I don't want to label Minnesota a fraud. I can dish out some more coach speak and just say, at the end of the day, there's 31 frauds. Does anyone give one shit who the runner up was in a Super Bowl or who made the conference championships? 30 days into the off season, nobody cares about anybody except who won. It really, it, it really, it's really what it boils down to. So, I'm enjoying this. It's rare to see the Vikings continuously play so well, and boy, boy, oh boy, I just keep thinking about all these crazy Minnesota games we've seen in the last decade with the, all the games involving the Saints. Right? <laughs> we saw all the craziness between those teams. So maybe we'll see some more iconic moments. Minnesota is a tough place to play. That whoever whoever has to go to Minnesota in round one or, or round two, like it's gonna be loud there. So I, I think if, Minnesota could rattle a few off, and hopefully they make us look good on this podcast. <laughs> if the Saints somehow make the playoffs, you gotta have Dre and I on the same pod at the same time, so we can just go off about it for a little bit. But Chiefs, sorry, I I, I knew you were gonna get, say something here. What I wanted to get in quick is because I haven't been here for a lot of the Vikings talk. I don't think they're fraudulent, but I think they are the seventh best team in the NFL right now. Oh, well, pretty good. I feel like that's uh, probably if, about right. If that's how you feel, like I'm not, I'm not here. So, so here's the thing, and that's why I tell people, I'm not here to argue about the Vikings from a uh, like league ranking standpoint. But people make the Vikings out like they're just not good at all, but they win football games. Listen, folks, if a team is not good, they don't win football games, a la Houston, a la the Colts. You know, like that that's what happens in, in football. The Falcons. You want, here's the my Bears, hot take. And the they're... Cardinals. The Rams. You, you, you get what I'm saying? Like, we're making it like the Vikings are these bottom-tier teams. That's what the media has done. to the, And that's not true. They just win close games. Like, that's what's happening. 10 and 0 in one-score games this year. Yep. And I think they'd be even better with 10 different quarterbacks. I think they're an MVP candidate this year. And you know what? I think Minnesota is a really, really good team. I'm still not a Kirk Cousins believer. I just think that offense around him is flipping amazing. I think they win the last three games of the year, though. I mean, it's the NFL. And what do I know at this point? But the Giants just 
you know, I, I'm less of a believer in the Giants than uh, than I am in Minnesota. Like, oh, yeah. So I think Minnesota gets it done at home. I think they beat the Packers on the road, and I think they beat the Bears on the road. So we're going to be sitting here, and they're going to rattle off the, la- the last three, potentially, in my opinion, and go into the playoffs with a ton of momentum. So what does the Jalen Hurts situation do for Philadelphia, though? Like, can we – can we talk about this and break this down a little bit more? I mean, they're just been absolutely, they've been rolling. Uh, and I, they, I think we can unanimously say they're the best team in the NFC. So what do you do if you're the Eagles at this point? Like how, how much do you <laughs> pressure this? If he's not a hundred percent, like look at the position Philadelphia is in chief and, and how would you attack pressure, this situation? Okay. So I, I don't think there's, any pressure per se, they're going to the playoffs regardless. Uh, they're 13 and one. So they, they, they've already clinched the wild card. There, there's no reason for this team to, uh, to not make the playoffs. They, they're pretty much already, they're already in. And then you go and look at their schedule. And I, I know it's in games, but I don't, I don't think we want to rush them back at all. Like if the Super Bowl is most important, like let's let's go get that. But I, I'm not rushing Jalen Hurts back to win a and I don't want to call it meaningless because I don't I don't feel like it's meaningless. But like they get the Saints this week. No 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 next week. Yeah. Next week, next week, next week. It's it's Cowboys this uh, week, which I do think is interesting in the purpose of like I don't play them. Don't care. You guys you guys don't get to see him. If we beat you, that's gonna ruin your psyche. If you win, well, who cares? We didn't have our starting quarterback. I think if it's possible, it does make a lot of sense for them to if he's ninety percent to have him back for the Saints game. The thing is with a shoulder injury and how he plays, you don't want to rush him back because he dings it one more time, all of a sudden he can't throw. And with how much he runs, that's very possible. But that Saints game is a very big one for them, not just from positioning in the NFC, but more so they have the Saints first round pick this year. So it's pretty important for them to push the Saints down the standings as far as they can go as opposed to allowing them to sneak into the playoffs. Correct me if I'm wrong. Philly just needs to win one game to clinch the number one seed, right? Is there three three weeks left? They have the tiebreaker with Minnesota. So they can lose twice, have three losses with this, in, in, if Minnesota wins out, and they'd still be the one seed. So I think I'm right about that. F- Philly can, can win a game without Jalen Hurts. It's Minshew Mania. It's Gardner Minshew. I don't think Philly wins this game this week for what it's worth. Like, I, I'm not buying that. But once again, the Cowboys just lost to to, to the the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. They won, and I, I understand Dak threw a walk off interception. They they possibly were going to win that game in overtime. So, uh, at any rate, like, hey, you know, don't worry about it. All right, we will move on. So we didn't see Mike White this week. Uh, we saw Zach Wilson. He threw for three hundred yards. The Jets fell to Detroit twenty to seventeen. The Lions keep winning. Jared Goff keeps winning. And don't look now. The Detroit Lions are five hundred. Jared Goff thirty six hundred yards, twenty three touchdowns, seven interceptions this season. Talk to me about Detroit and the Jets. What are your takeaways from this one, Chief? TJ, listen. Detroit, they've crept their way. I mean, this team looks like they're on the way to a war. They get the Panthers this week. And, yeah, I, I'm not expecting the Panthers to win this game. Man. Like, just I, – I'm not expecting it. So, um so when I, I watched could... all these when I watched all these press conferences with their coach of like we're gonna bite their kneecaps and then after we bite their kneecaps we're gonna shit them out and then eat them again and throw it at them and all this crazy stuff that he was saying like I thought he was an idiot and this was gonna go very poorly. 
they are such a well-coached team. This defense has gotten better and better as the year goes on. They seem prepared for their opponent. Goff looks good. This is a surprising team for me this year. I mean, Jared Goff has a little bit of talent around him. Finally, like when they're on the field, DeAndre Swift needs to stay healthy. Jamison Williams, I think, is going to be very good. They want to allegedly keep golf around long term. Are, are you, in, you guys in favor of that happening? The quarterback pool this year, just like it doesn't seem as strong as it was maybe five, six years ago. And so I honestly don't hate the idea. Chief, I think we should talk about the Dallas Jacksonville game. The Jaguars don't look now have a very realistic shot of winning this division. Dak throws a walk-off pick in overtime. Just utter ridiculousness here. And um, let's have this discussion. I mean, this was just a chaotic game. There was a lot of GPP winners in the DFS world in this one. Zay Jones, a hat trick of touchdowns. Those FanDuel odds on the sportsbook were probably pretty crazy. Etienne had 100 yards. Everyone loved this Dallas defense in the beginning of the season, and then you get 40 hung on you by Jacksonville. <laughs> what do you make of the Dallas Cowboys? You talked about the NFC. You didn't mention Dallas Cowboys, TJ. Where do you rank them in your hierarchy of, of who's who? 10-ish. Like I think they have a higher ceiling than a lot of these other teams. They have a lot of talent. They just haven't quite put it together. They've had a lot of players missing at times, but I think they also got a really low floor. Um, like I just – don't view them as a I'm trying to think of what player they are that I can compare them to in like a DFS setting, you know, but like, I don't view them as a cash game play. I view them as a GPP play where they could explode in the tournament. They, they can look real good at times, but my, do they ever just look terrible as well? The, the magnifying glass is always on them. The spotlight is always bright. And so I think little things can turn into big things with them pretty darn quick. And, I don't view them as a Super Bowl contender per se. Like, sure, they could do something crazy like an Eli Manning Giants at 9-7 and seven coming in and winning, but, like, I don't view them as the same top tier of teams. I kind of view them as, if I see the Vikings as Tier 2, I kind of see the Cowboys as Tier 3. Dak Prescott's thrown 11 picks in nine games. He hasn't thrown for 300 yards once. When are we going to start to call him a game manager, Chief? Uh, anytime you like. I don't. I don't. I don't spare how I how I feel about these guys. Like, you know, uh, that. But what I will say is that will have some some three hundred yard games sprinkled in throughout the season. We've seen that from him. But you know, all in all, the Cowboys are we we think they are. Like their defense is good. They're good. They fly around. And and let me just say, Dan has improved. This right, so I don't, I don't want to take anything away. Like they're improved, don't get me wrong. But once again, you know who who do you think comes out of the the NFC in a general sense? I think everybody would assume the Eagles. Like, isn't that the case? I think if Dallas holds the five seed. I wouldn't want to play Tampa Bay and Tom Brady in the first round because I think Tampa Bay would find a way to beat this Dallas Cowboys team. I really do. And it doesn't feel good, and I don't feel great about that. But Dallas seems to shoot itself in the foot game after game with turnovers. And if you give Tampa Bay one or two extra possessions, I think they'll find a way to grind it out, especially, especially if they're at home. They might be a 500 team, but they're going to get a home game if they win the NFC South. So if I'm Dallas, Tom Brady's the last person on the planet right now, realistically, that I want to see in the first round of the playoffs. You're not going to get the Eagles, right? You're not going to get Minnesota. Out of the remaining crop of teams that TJ ran through, like the Niners probably aren't going to happen either. I'd, I'd rather play. I'd, I would say I'd rather play the Bucks than the Niners. 100%. A hundred percent, but I don't think it's going to happen. So I, I think, I think it's Tom Brady. And I think it's a terrible draw for them. I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy, but that's just how I'm seeing it. 
I don't disagree with you. Like I, they look really bad, but I wouldn't want to have to face my New Orleans Saints in the first round, who they're going to be facing anyways. So you think you think the Saints come out of the NFC South, or you just no? I'm just bullshit. I'm just I'm just messing around. Sorry, I don't know if I can say the S word on the pod. That's my second time doing it now, so I won't again if that's a no no. But uh, um, choke up um, on the bat. Yeah, yeah, we'll bring it up a little bit. That was an accident; it slipped out. But uh, no, no big bad ones, you know, just like the just like the the medium ones, just like the ones that aren't aren't that bad. But um, the Tampa Bay doesn't look good. But I do still just take Tom Brady over Andy Dalton 10 times out of 10. So I think they're going to squeak out of this one. But my hope is still alive. My hope is still alive for sure. I mean, we could waste time and talk about Kansas City almost losing to Houston and how fraudulent they are, but they won a National Football League game, right? I mean, no one's saying the Chiefs are frauds. Tennessee loses a close one to the Chargers. That offensive line is horrible. Ryan Tannehill, I don't know how he survived through the game. Dennis Daly continues to be the worst football player on the planet. He is so bad. He is on the top. Uh, the top pressures yielded via PFF since 2016. He's on the list twice with two different teams. He is, I mean, he's borderline negligent to protect the man's health behind him. This Titans line is so bad. And, uh, you know, although they – Kept the game close in LA with a competitive, you know, playoff bound Chargers team. I feel pretty awful about Tennessee's odds to actually win this division at this point. I think the Jaguars are going to do it. I, I really do. We'll see what happens. Cincinnati came all the way back, right? Like that was a complete flip around as well. If it wasn't for the Vikings chaotic game, the talk of this week would be the Bengals, you know, def- race deficit against Tom and, and Tampa Bay. That, that, that true. Okay, is your glass half full or half empty? Are the Bengals frauds, or do you love that they hustled and came all the way back and scored thirty-one in the second half to beat Tom Brady on the road? I don't know. Where where do you put this Bengals team? Tell me this. Like contenders, pretenders, indifferent chief. Where are the Bengals? Who are the Bengals? I mean, the Bengals are your <laughs> NFC. I mean, AFC North division champions. That, that's who the Bengals are, and they're going to win this division. And, you know, some some weird AFC is going to have to go into Cincinnati for their first playoff game and lose. That that That's basically what you're seeing here. The Steelers aren't the – they're the best team in the division, especially with Lamar Jackson hurt. Steelers have, you know, been on a quarterback carousel between Trubisky and, uh, and um, Kenny Pickett and – Cleveland just got Deshaun Watson back. They're not winning the division. Like it's it's their division. They're, they're going to win it easily. So, how, what's the Bengals' upside, TJ? Can they get hot again and make a run? I think so for sure. Like I, I kind of look at this. Bengals are in my my tier one of teams. The Bengals, the Eagles, the Chiefs, the Bills. That's kind of the. Group one, I look at the Vikings, I kind of see as the top of tier two um, alongside the 49ers. But I like I I like the Bengals. I think they're I think they're legit. Yeah, uh, I, I do like the Bengals quite a bit. Any, we even talk, we, go ahead. Go ahead. Any team with a like an elite quarterback, I trust as a contender. Like if you're if you have Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrow, I don't see at this point Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, like. I trust you to be able to make a run in the playoffs. We didn't talk about either of the other two Saturday games. Cleveland 13-3 over Baltimore. Buffalo hanging on. Oh, or is Buffalo a fraud? They barely hung on against the warm weather Dolphins. There was 61 points in a game where, you know, where there were supposed to be the worst conditions of all time and the total was at 43 and a half. Buffalo getting it done at home, Chief. The Miami Dolphins are on the schneid. We talk about the Dolphins a lot. Do you have any difference in opinion of Miami? What is the upside? Are we still talking Super Bowl contenders? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, I, I'm not getting off the Miami train either, and here's why. Like, do you think Miami had a shot to beat Buffalo this weekend? Yes or no? Even, even in the conditions. Do you think they had a shot? Kind of. I mean, Buffalo – has been playing mediocre football the last month or so. Well, well here's what I'm saying. Score 
Buffalo never ran away with this football game. And they were they were in Buffalo, right? Like it's not like they were in my they were in Buffalo and Buffalo never got real separation. And Buffalo hasn't gotten real separation in weeks. Weeks. Right? So do I think Buffalo's a good football team? Absolutely, right? Like and I, I think this is something we've talked about on the pod a lot, but just want to kind of reintroduce it yet again this week. If you're looking for teams to win 40 to 10 in the National Football League every week, you're, you've, you've already got that mistaken. Most games are going to be within a touchdown. Like most, and that's the good teams. And to prove that, Luke, I'll pull up this week's scores. Who, who's one of the best teams? Just give me one, Luch. Just give me one. The Miami Dolphins. Okay. They lost by three points. Give me another okay. team that you think is one of the top teams in the league. The, the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> they won by three points. How about another okay, you, team that you think is a top-tier team? Just, just give me another. All right. All right. Do the Eagles. Do the Chiefs. Go ahead. Eagles. Oh, I'll go Chiefs first. 30 to 24 in overtime. Eagles, 25 to 20 in regulation. 49ers, let's go back to Thursday. 21 to 13. Right? So Raiders, 30 to 24 in the Patriots. And we're not saying they're good. Bengals, 34 to 23, and they were down 17 up. Giants beat the Commanders 20 to 12. Chargers beat the Titans 17 to 4. 14. Saints beat the Falcons 21 to 18, and nobody thinks the Saints and Falcons are actually extremely good. And Jaguars beat the Cowboys on a walk-off interception 40 to 34. I see one game this week or two now where there's a difference. Well, three. Let's go. Well, yeah, two where there's a difference of more than 10 points. Everybody else is within 10. So it, you get what I'm saying? Like even the bad teams are scoring points and not losing by wide margins every week. A la the Texans, uh, you know, a la the Seahawks, and they're not a bad team either, the Colts. And those are the bottom feeder teams. So if you're asking me, do I still believe in the Dolphins? Yes. Can the Dolphins go into the Bills and get one in the playoffs? Maybe. Yes. Like, I think we're, we've seen this this year, any team in the National Football League can get beaten. But the good teams win the close game. I think we can agree on that. Any team can lose or can be beaten. The good teams are going to win more close games. Listen, we have a, a pretty massive Thursday night football game for once. I don't, you know, if you rewind time about a year, you probably wouldn't think Jaguars Jets had a ton of playoff implications on December 22, 2022. But it does. It really does. Jacksonville comes up north to Jersey to play the Jets. Uh, New York, they're one and a half point dogs. You guys have a lean in this game? What needs to be done? We don't know who we're getting a quarterback for the Jets. If they're going to run back Zach Wilson or if Mike Wade's going to be healthy enough to play. The Jaguars have some serious momentum. This is going to be a good game. There's a lot on the line here. It's going to be chippy. The emotions are going to be high. I'm actually really looking forward to this game. I don't care if it's ugly. The total's at 38 and a half. TJ, Jets, Jaguars, do you have a lean on either side here? And if you do, why? We got uh, – my lean is always to the quarterback. And so we we got uh, news that Mike White is unlikely to play in this one. He did with practice in a limited capacity on Monday, but they uh, they announced that he's unlikely to play. And so with just straight Zach Wilson against Trevor Lawrence, I do trust the better quarterback side first. So my lean is to the Jags. Now I do think the Jets defense is quite a bit better than the Jags defense. You look at what their strength is though. They got a guy like sauce Gardner shutting down number one receivers. Lawrence doesn't really focus on a number one. Sometimes it's Zay Jones. Sometimes it's Christian Kirk. Sometimes it's Evan Ingram. Um, And so I do think Jacksonville is going to take this one, but I think it's going to be a pretty close game. What I will say is I may have some, I guess, I don't know if bias is the right word or me just actually doubling down on what I say. Um, 
I've been playing a lot more underdog drafts lately. I got my best ball payouts. The teams didn't make it all the way through to the final, but had some good teams to get some payouts in. And so I put some of those in drafts. I got second in the NFL one last week, and then I've been doing the Monday to Thursday NFL one this week. And I played a, I have, I drafted a bunch of teams that went um, just Aaron Jones or just uh, AJ Dillon from this game. And I got a bunch of Trevor Lawrence stacks, like about 25 different drafts. So if he has a good day, uh, it's going to be a good financial day for me. But uh, I, I do think the, I do think, the Jaguars are going to pull away. Like I like, I like cheering for them. It's a team. I want to be good. Chief, what are your thoughts on this one? This should be a good game, man. Like I'm, I'm pretty excited about, you know, this, this spot in general, um, you know, both teams want to win. Like, And I think you kind of summed it up perfectly here. You know, if the Jags keep winning, then they could very well win their division. How crazy would that be if the Jags, and I don't want to say out of nowhere, because out of nowhere is probably a stretch of some sort, but the Jags are positioned to win this division. It's insane. And you you wouldn't have been able to tell me that earlier this year with uh with the with the Titans kind of on a roll here. You wouldn't have been able to tell me that. So I think this is exciting. It's interesting. Um, and then once again, Jets coming off of another loss. Will they rebound here at home? I'm going to side with the Jags because I feel like I feel like the Jags have a little bit more to play for. Both teams want to get in. The Jags can win the division. Imagine that. As crazy as that sounds. The Titans are decimated every year. The last two years have been horrible. They they broke an NFL record with bodies used last year. This year, they're up to 80 players used. I don't understand. At some point, you got to point your finger at the training staff and, and the health and training staff. I, I just I really don't understand. Uh, Tennessee was missing seven defensive starters last week on top of nobody at left tackle, of course. And uh, Traylon Burks, now that was a fluky thing and, you know, the headhunting by the Eagles, you know, in the end zone, whatever. Um, yes, the Jaguars are – have a shot to to make week, week 18 against Tennessee <laughs> crazy. Like, that game could be flexed. If the Titans lose this week to the Texans, God forbid, you just rattle off how many one-score games there were in the NFL. And if Jacksonville wins on Thursday night – it's on, baby. It's on. And as a Titans fan, I don't feel great about it. But as a fan of the sport, uh, I would be kind of excited. You can't knock the Jets, though. They were down inside the 10 against Minnesota three weeks ago on the road. Lost that game. Lost a one-score game at Buffalo. Uh, and, of course, lost a, another one-score three-point game against Detroit. So this is about as coin flip of a game as it gets, I think, even with Zach Wilson in there. I am going to say Jets by a nose. I just, I'm a fan of the front seven there, and I'm a fan of Sauce Gardner. TJ made a good point about how Lawrence has done a great job of spreading the ball around. So I think this game could, could really go either way. I know we can't spend a million hours on the Thursday night football game, so I'll bounce over here to our Minnesota Vikings, three and a half point favorites against the New York football Giants. Minnesota's at home. The Giants coming off a really big win against Washington on Sunday night football. Do you have any doubts about Minnesota taking care of business here, Will Priester? No. Um, they, they should be able to beat the Giants. I'm, I'm just – I'm not worried about it at all. I know I'm keeping it pretty pretty straight and to the point, but come on, man. We, we, we can't go out and lose to the Giants this week. Can't. And, and we as in the Vikings, not me as in a Vikings fan. Well, Chief's not worried, TJ. Are you worried? A little bit. I don't think the Giants are all that bad. This is in Minnesota, so I think the Vikings are going to pull away with it. Like you said, they're good in close games, but I do think they're going to give them a threat. I think they're going to keep this one tight. How about... Your Saints traveling to Cleveland. The Browns are three-point favorites here. Going to be cold. 
going to be cold for the Dome team, but I'll give you the floor. Give me the breakdown here of what would win the game for the Saints and what's your score prediction? I mean, defense and keeping the ball on the ground, not turning it over. That's really their only way they ever come away with things. They, Their defense hasn't been getting any takeaways this year, but they've been doing a pretty good job of limiting points. I mean, I don't really trust an Andy Dalton. I would have more faith if this was Jameis Winston, but like we see the 31.5 total in this game, just dreadfully low. Um Either Taysom Hill or Alvin Kamara will have a big game if the Saints win, and it's going to be on the back of Nick Chubb if uh, the Browns pull away with this one. But, like, it's going to be ugly. Don't watch this one on TV. <laughs> 31 and a half. That's the lowest total. It, I got to find some data of the lowest NFL totals we've actually had on a board. I I can't remember one that low Can in a regular season game. can That's a preseason line. Can you guys remember a total that low? Seriously, like, Chief, do you? I can. Low? It was it was the uh, Detroit Pistons versus the Indiana Pacers in the Eastern Conference Finals in nineteen ninety four five. I'm exaggerating, but that that that's was old so school low. basketball as far as yeah, that that's that's very low, unbelievably low. Well, if you want to throw some Millie darts in, you know no one's getting ownership in this game. You're going to be on an island. If, the, if this game somehow exceeds the total by three touchdowns, you're, you're going to have all the players you want in this game. I will not be stacking, but, I mean, hey, if I'm playing DFS, I'm going to be mixing and matching some players from this game. A little, little Camaro, a little Taysom Hill, a little Nick Chubb. And, Lush, what did you think about my uh... – Shahid call on uh, crunch time on Sunday. First drive of the game. Touchdown pass from Taysom Hill for 60 yards. I think you're two for two because if you're not tuned into crunch time with TJ and I, last week you called Jameson Williams. This week it was Shahid. So the pressure's on. Pressure's on. These first drive sub 5K receiver touchdowns. Oh, man. Yeah. How often – now, you, you, you've you probably been playing the most DFS out of the three of us for NFL this season. We've I've been playing maybe every other week. Uh, like, like actually playing, you know, I'm, real volume. Um, how often are you – like, how much are you correlating your lineups? You know, like secondary stacks, et cetera. Got to throw a little DFS in here. I'll talk a little strategy here. <laughs> so, I do this in NFL a lot more than most. Um And it's actually held me back this year. It won me a ton of money last year. I played my quarterback, chalky offense, chalky game stack. But as opposed to a one stack or a two receiver stack, I do a three receiver stack and run it back with a a player or two on the other side. The game goes off. You win a bunch of money. It worked for me a lot last year. This year it has actually been holding me back. And like you, I've been looking a lot at the like, first place 200k to first or millie maker style lineups and while in the past i see a lot of three-man stacks there it hasn't really been as much the case this year um the game stack hasn't come through as much as i thought it would or i just get my defense wrong or my tight end wrong and so it's been wild this nfl season how i've basically just been consistently like plus or minus 20% like just making my money back every single week I might lose a couple hundred I might win a couple hundred but no big days no poor days I've just been doing fine all NFL season I got an I shipped an under got second in an underdog contest the other day so that was nice but my strategy was work worked a lot better last year for me than it has been so far this year thanks for sharing good to know I gotta say this stop though don't don't stop. <laughs> don't stop. Don't stop. I gotta hit one of my NBA multi answer bills. I've I've had a good core on countless nights here. I mean you know, I need to get one on FanDuel. So I'm coming. I'm coming. The loose takedown's coming. If it's not me, I hope it's one of you guys. And if it's not one of you guys, I hope it's countless numbers of our listeners that are making some money. I hope so. Tell you what, I really want to hit this Eagles plus six right now at Dallas. Boy, do I I I, I really do. If you're in a Sports Illustrated book state, which I think is only uh, operating in three states, the line is seven and a half. 
They have some brutal lines over there at Sports Illustrated. I don't have them here. So much of that Philly offense is just based on read options and designed run for Jalen Hurts. I don't know how easily um, Gardner Minshew is just going to be able to step in and run this offense. Yeah, he's fine though. Like he, he's he, mobile. He is. He's it's mobile. Just like he's, he's mobile in the pocket. Um, I don't know. I just feel like we forget how good that offensive line really is sometimes, and I, I think he's capable. I think he's capable. I think this game's close. I think it's a good line, right? It opened at one. It opened at one. I'm looking at scoresnaz.com. It opened at one, and uh, now we're seeing six in most places. I don't know. Can Gardner Minshew get it done this week, Chief? Where am I? Am I? I you, you you said they're not winning this week. Can they cover? Uh, maybe. Maybe, and, and, and I'm saying a strong maybe because you know how I feel about quarterbacks when they come in week one. If this was week two, and I know he's a true backup, don't get me wrong, he's been in the league, so I'm not played a lot of football at uh, I think the Artemis you played at Washington State, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. Washington State, Colt Leach, uh, God rest his soul, uh, rest in peace, Mike Leach. Here's what I will say I'm not buying the fact that. This week, because I don't know if Gardner Minshew is going to be able to move this offense down the field this week, first weekend with the with the starters as the true starting quarterback. I'm going to give their offense a bump down next week. I think Gardner Minshew is perfectly fine. I'm taking the birds. I'm taking them plus six. I'm gonna I'm gonna put my bet in as soon as we wrap up the show here. I. I, I feel good about it. I feel like he's capable. I, I feel like he's a lo- like a bottom tier QB one. I think he, you know, I'm fine with it. He's, they got great skill players, a great line. And Miles Sanders is awesome. The defensive line's good. You know, Dak's going to turn the ball over at least once, right? You know, it's coming. So yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, but uh, I kind of like the six. I, I do. I think I like... If you're betting the Eagles plus six, I like it paired with the under because I don't think it's Gardner Minshew that wins this game. I think it's the Eagles defense. I like it. By the way, check out Parlay IQ on scores and odds free. If you're in the same game parlays, you got to check out Parlay IQ. It, it's awesome. I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. Well, any other games on the on the agenda you guys want to bring up here? I mean, it's a, a massive slate. We got Christmas Eve action and a couple on Christmas Day. So, actually, we have three games on Christmas Day, and the rest are Christmas Eve, other than the primetime games. So, it's going to be a fun weekend of football. So, here, here's the game that I think is the underlying game of the week. And it's going to sound crazy, right? It's going to sound crazy. Just go with me on a journey here, if you will. What if what if I told you the game of the week is the Commanders 49ers? Because both of these teams, which the 49ers, if they keep winning, they're going to win a division. Play, you know, Brock Purdy's been playing fine. But doesn't this smell like one of those Commanders upsets again? Where they just go into somebody's stadium, they play great defense. You you don't get to score enough points on them like you wanted to early, and Joey Sly just walks this thing off with a field goal with like five seconds left to spare. Commanders after after tying with the with the Giants lose to the Giants, and then going going to San Francisco and beat the 49ers, and everybody's left with another head scratcher. Like, how did this happen? What in the world is going on with the NFL? I, it feels yucky until you think about the commander style of play. B- both of these teams are going to play good defense. They want to run the football. And whichever team can get in, get into the box or kick the field goal late is going to win this game. Insane, I know. But but what, what is, what's the line on, on the commander's 49ers right now? I got to think. What, Seven what and a half. Up? Oh, give me the points. Like that, that's that. Give me plus seven and a half on the commanders here. As good as that, that San Francisco defense is, I think the commanders give 
Purdy his first sign of trouble this week? TJ, thoughts? I don't like them to win, but I do like the plus seven and a half because I think this is going to be a very slow, yes. defensive, grinded out game. And so I don't think a lot of points are going to be scored. And with that, seven and a half is a lot of points to cover in a low scoring, so uh, like a lot of points to win by in a low scoring, uh, slow game. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm with you. I, I, I don't really like them to come in and pull off the upset, but I think seven and a half is too big and I definitely like them to cover. Well, well, let me ask you this, and TJ, and, and this is a little bit of a, let's call it imagery behind the discussion. Imagery behind the discussion. I think whichever team makes the last mistake loses this game. Like, Brock Purdy's played near-perfect football, right, to be like the third-string guy. At some point, he's got to play poorly. Like, the variance has got to hit. And it's it's got in my opinion it'll be against a defense that's that's fairly competent like the Commanders. So if you look at the past couple of weeks, I mean, last week they played the Dolphins, no, no Buccaneers. The, the, listen, they, they should have beat the Buccaneers. He's been at home. This is going to be four straight games at home now. No, he was on the road against the Seahawks. Sorry, on the road, but. He's back at home. He's been at home four out of the last five games. The Commanders are by far the best defense he's going to play. And the Saints, they won 13-0. 13-0 against the Saints. That was earlier on. And they won 21-13 on the road against the Seahawks. I think the Commanders give him some trouble this week for what it's worth. And that's, I agree. Really, I, where, I agree. that's really where this is coming in at. I think he makes a mistake that possibly cost him this game. Whether it's the middle of the game and it's some type of field position where they, it swings back in Washington's favor and Washington can punch it in. Like, that's really what I'm talking about. Like, the 49ers offense is better than the Washington offense straight up. But Purdy hasn't faced a defense this good this season yet. And I think they give him pr- trouble because the running game and good defense will travel in the NFL. The I'll, I'll definitely fear that defense a lot more if chase young is back and like you said i agree they're going to give him some trouble and i think this one is going to be pretty close the one thing i would say though is i don't know how much i don't know if there's really that much room for brock purdy to come in and blow a game like you look at this 49ers team with kyle shanahan they've been winning games whether it's trey lance whether it's jimmy g who's not all that good himself all, all this guy's got to do is dump it off to Christian McCaffrey and dump it off to George Kittle all day long and then just rely on that defense, keep good field yeah. position. And so I don't really think there's going to be much room for him to lose it. But it's like you said, I still think that defense will give him some trouble. I still think this is going to be a slow, slow game. And so I do really like that spread. Let, let, last point here. The commanders are going to take the running game away. They're going to like Purdy's going to have to throw the football if they're going to win this game. And, and and I'm saying that because Saquon Barkley's bottled up the whole game until like the fourth quarter where he rattles off a couple runs when you know they just they just weren't expecting it. But all Washington will really suppress the run game. And if they can't get the run game going, Brock Purdy's got to go out and win the game. And that, that's where I think the trouble may come. But I know we spent a lot of time on that game, but I, I did want to highlight that one. And I'm glad you were able to get that. Plus seven and a half, man. G- give, me, give me the commanders all day. This really does feel like, a, from a prop standpoint too, this really does feel like a Christian McCaffrey catches 10 plus balls game. Yeah. Devil's advocate. San Francisco is going to do the exact same thing to Washington, though. When, when they're winning games, they're running Gibson, they're running Brian Robinson, and they're picking up yards. Seven and a half, it seems like a lot. I'm playing devil's advocate here. San Fran's margin of victory at home this year is 18 points, which just seems unsustainable, and it probably is. <laughs> like, it probably is. They played, what, six home games? Uh, but, man, they've been convincing. Um, I don't know. That, that That's a big number. You're right. First instinct is to take the points. But then after looking just at everything, could- I, I think they cover it. I think San Fran covers it. Could you just not see this game, it. though, being 10 to 3? Well, as long as it's 11 to 3, I'll be happy. 
<laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I feel like that's Giants football too with Saquon. He's bottled up for three quarters and he breaks a 50 yarder and like, wow, Saquon, you know, he had a pretty good game behind that offensive Saquon line. Saquon was <laughs> bottled up the whole game. Then he rattled off like a 12 yarder, a 13 yarder, a 14 That's yarder. every Giants game, man. I'm telling you. But you're right. I think then he's just in better shape than everyone else on the field. And so by the end of the game, when everyone's worn down, the lack of blocking doesn't matter. And he gets his large runs that that is, this game. I would be even so much more intrigued that this game was in Washington. Right. We'd see the spread probably be half of what it is. And uh, that that would be fun. But hey, Niners are playing at home. The Brock Purdy era. The Brock Purdy era, the Baker Mayfield Rams era, the Zach Wilson is back era, the Gardner Minshew mania to close out the year. Like these names we're talking about at quarterback in my wildest dreams, guys. I I didn't even think Andy Dalton would be playing football for the Saints, TJ. I, you know, Jameis Winston's rotting away wasn't. there. I understand. I understand. <laughs> Got anything for GPP food of the day or story time, Chief? I'm going to give TJ a minute. I know he's all the way up in Canada. I think you have restaurants up there. Maybe you've been somewhere good. We do have some Canadian listeners. I've seen our demo. I've seen our demographics and our numbers here. So, uh, Chief, give me a good story or give me somewhere good to eat, Look, man. So this is one from today because you know me and the, the lady were out looking at some venues today. For the, stop for breakfast at a place called Vicious Biscuit. Uh, I'm not sure if. You know, if they I don't, they may not have those in your area. I, I feel like it's fairly local. Vicious biscuit, and it's a breakfast place, obviously. And it, they are delicious biscuits with a twist. So, like today, their signature is called the vicious. It's an open faced jalapeno cheddar biscuit, fried a piece of succulent fried chicken breast atop some maple honey syrup. I think that's what they call it. Some maple maple sausage gravy and and something that they call candied cowboys. It's candied jalapenos on the, with the breakfast dish as well. Incredible folks. I mean, incredible. The missus got a shrimp and grits plate with a buttermilk biscuit on the side. The biscuit is the size of, uh, let's see, let's call it a, a, a tab 10 or a tab 8. A 8.1 or something. It's huge. And they've got all these spreads that you can put on it, honey butter. They've got a, they've got a jelly called apple pie. Oh, my goodness. And we put that thing in that biscuit. She shared it with me. By ch- uh, obviously, that was her biscuit. She shared it. Fantastic. Vicious Biscuit, if you're in the Charleston, South Carolina area, check them out. They've got a, a robust menu of biscuit options. And I will be going back at some point. First time going there today. Did it on the same day we have Food for Thought. Everybody go enjoy. I have to ask you a quick question before I let TJ talk. Yes. Has, has any friendly representative from the fast food establishment that shall not be named ever gotten back to you yet since your poor experience? Oh, oh of course not. Of course not. It's ter- just terrible. Terrible have service. You, have you been back? Of course not. Man they shall word. not get any more of my money for the rest of my life unless I get a call back. So they probably won't be. TJ, tell me a story. What have you eaten good up in Canada recently? Or what has happened to you that has been funny lately? Or ironic? Or life-changing? I mean, we've talked about engagements on this on this show for story time. We've talked about kids crapping their pants at soccer games. Like We've talked about pretty much everything. Wide, a wide array of stories I've been told over the past year and a half. So I'll uh, give you a couple a couple few short short stories here. So from a food standpoint, you know, as, as you guys know, I'm, I'm quite a bit of a homebody, do a lot of ordering in stuff like that, but I've been actually trying to limit that lately. 
save some money uh, from the ordering food in and work on doing some more cooking because I quit my teaching job this year. The last time we would have been on this pod in August, I would have still been doing it. Now I'm done. I'm focusing on my Roto Grinder stuff, also focusing on Agents of Fandom, which I'll kind of touch on a bit more uh, in, in a second. But from a food standpoint, I've been working on cooking more meals. My wife gets home every day around five o'clock. It's nice to have something going there that's ready when she gets home. And then I get to just start focusing on my DFS stuff for the next 45 minutes before NBA lock, that type of thing. And so just the other day, I was really, I had so many different cravings and I didn't know what it was. And so I decided to just make a nacho chili platter and it was just amazing sauteed some beef bought some beef out of the out of the freezer in the morning let it uh let it thaw out sauteed some beef and some onions and some beans together put in some uh little little sauce then i decided to just take a huge cookie sheet lay out all the nachos lay out a bunch of cheese put the chili on top lay out more cheese lay out more chili get myself a nice stack and then uh had a bunch of extra beef left over so the next day with the beef and the beans made some rice made some burrito bowls and i just felt real proud of myself that was just how damn good all of this stuff tasted and it was about a good three four days worth of food um put and some so hot sauce I was, I was in my burrito baby it was nice like it just like a good good mexican dish just really it hits the spot in a on a cold winter night you know a nice nice hot food from a hot place on a cold winter night here in where we're, we're chilling in what, like minus 15 Fahrenheit right now. Um, and so oh, it really, no wonder it you're really warms home. you right up. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to go out right now. It's too cold. I go out in the summertime. The summertime what are your summers? Are your summers even hot up there? Do you, do you have sun? There is nowhere I'd rather be than where I am in the summer. Like it, we have a good three straight months of 75 to 105. And it's just fantastic. Like it doesn't really rain very much. It's just 75 to 105 for a full three straight months from uh, June through September. It's great. But yeah, don't get me wrong. The winters are the winters are, are horrific. 105, like Fahrenheit 105. Yeah. Yeah. Damn. It gets that hot up there. Sometimes? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, like we'll have like we'll have a good two, three weeks in July, August that it's like 95 plus consistently for those three weeks. A little bit of everything up there, huh? Yeah, yeah, big time, big time. And then, like, like, like you, like you mentioned last time we talked, it was before the NFL season started, so it was it was August, and I want to just give a quick, quick tire pump of like when in August when I we just launched the Agents of Fandom website in March, and in August we were still like maybe just the same three guys that we started with, maybe four or five people on the team working to get an article out every couple days, that type of thing. And we have 30 members of the team now. We're not just covering superhero movies. We're covering all movies and film. In the new year, we're branching out into sports, into music. We're helping produce a move. We're like, we're executive producing a movie this year. Um, and just all this different stuff. And so I'm just kind of so proud of the little community and family we built because mm-hmm. It's been a pretty cool journey this year from back in August. The last time we linked up here, there was there's three of us on the team. And now we've got a little 30 person team and we're putting together some pretty awesome content. That is awesome, man. And uh, it's amazing what you can do when you put your head down, work hard and, and network a little. And hey, I hope 2023 is yours, man. We're, we're knocking on the door. Need a um, little need a big GPP win in the meantime so I can uh, fund the, the things I need to. <laughs> Totally get it. Unfortunately, um, Monday's showdown wasn't friendly to me, but uh, we will leave that for uh, future content. Um, I ate at a hibachi on Friday, and I don't know what's better than sitting at an L-shaped table. You know, I went with my girlfriend, and we sat with four strangers because that's what they do there. And you know, they kept thinking we were together as like a whole. We're like, no, we're not with them. We don't even know them. But, you know, you sit down and you awkwardly stare at people. Maybe you talk to them a little bit, whatever. And just seeing them cook right in front of you and they do all the tricks and they flip the bottles around and, you know, they're throwing food around, whatever. And uh, I tell you what, I don't think I've laughed as hard in a while when, I mean, some places they'll like throw chicken or steak and like everyone tries to catch it in their mouth or whatever, but they were throwing vegetables. But this guy was just pelting my girlfriend in the forehead with 
vegetables that like he was throwing because she couldn't catch it. It was just so funny. I, I don't know. I laugh. She's gonna kill me. But um, yeah, yeah. Oh, the little hilarious. things that make you laugh. But disclaimer: no, she said she, though, bro. she she said I I am terrible at this. I know they're gonna throw vegetables or something at me, and she was right. She owned up to it. She was pretty bad. But uh, you gotta love the hibachi. You know the flat top right in front of you. The little show they put on and. Um, there's just something special about about eating in those places. Uh, I want to go to one up in like New City, man. I want to go to like an authentic one, but which is authentic as I'll probably get here. <laughs> something special, you know, about getting pelted in the face with hot vegetables. Well, they weren't hot. I mean, we didn't sign any waivers or anything. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I guess that's it. I mean, hey, the next time we'll be on the show. Uh, Hanukkah and Christmas will be wrapping up and uh, the holiday season and what everyone is celebrating. And uh, I don't know. Chief, you want to give a shout out to anybody for the holidays? Uh, shout out to my beautiful daughters, my son, my family. And shout out to the prop shop and uh, all the listeners. I know. I know. Listen, man, I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to come on and and I share my thoughts with everyone, people that will listen, some that don't. And um, I feel blessed. And hopefully everybody has a safe and happy Christmas, happy holiday season. And uh, and enjoy your family. That was really well said. I don't, I don't even want to follow it up because that was uh, that was genuine and to the point. And, you know. I'm fortunate to be doing this thing with you guys and you know TJ and I do a lot of work together too and the whole RG crew and everyone at scores and odds, including the, the the team behind the scenes, like the people that the people that no one knows about that make this these companies go that we work with um are incredible. Uh from the, the operations to the projections team, um to even you know the customer service and, and, and the whole nine. Like it it's been a pleasure. We thank you for all your hard work. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about 2023. One more show before the new year, Chief. Uh, but until then, we're going to head out of here. So, TJ, thanks again for joining us, and uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you guys so much for having me on. I, uh, the holiday season, it's a good time to be thankful. So thankful, just like you said, for this RG team. Been watching you guys for years, so I'm thankful to be finally a part of it. Chief, you didn't know it, but... We've been winning money together for many a years when I've been listening to the morning grind. So, so fun to finally be a part of this team doing show with you uh, shows with you guys and shout out to all the listeners as well. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah. Um, hopefully you get together with your family. If not, just remember to, t- to take some time for you. You are, uh, we're all working. We're all working crazy hours, doing busy stuff, trying to make ends meet. You are, more than your productivity, take some time to take care of yourself. Do something you like uh, for yourself as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we thank you, listeners. Thanks for hanging out with us. It's a season two of Food for Thought, and uh, we, we love it. So thanks for sticking with us. We're heading out of here. For Chief and TJ, I'm Justin. Happy holidays. Have a good week, and good luck.